And good evening. It's September 24th, 2024. We're continuing our collection of discussions in our Outside the Class series. Series from the Bible Project. It's about the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. The dustbeat.com. In the Outside the Class section, we have the Tanakh, the Old Testament source video section, of course, set up for your, your review. Because the intent of Outside the Class for you to listen to that in-class lecture first. It will be found in that source video playlist. We're going to try to keep these to about 15 minutes, make them easy to catch and easy to catch up on. So we're on a quest, scroll by scroll, book by book, a journey through this collection, but with a fun and different twist on outside the class, on the dusty feet. And before we forget, if you find these kinds of podcasts useful, you click the subscribe button. The reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, it's when you click that like button. Because it is, that is how YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. In this series, we're going to cover the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. And yet, we're going to do it in the original order of this collection, the Hebrew Scriptures order. So it could get interesting as we get past the first five. Remember, these videos we're going to be discussing, they're just the tip of the iceberg. They are part of a learning series that I highly recommend, and they can all be found on the Bible Project website, and of course in our source video playlist. Because we're going to be asking all kinds of questions about all kinds of things, of which we're probably not going to know or get an answer. It is what it is. Leviticus, Vaikra, right? This is part two. As you can tell from this series, I enjoy the Tanakh, the Old Testament, right? And this scroll is at the core of what I find more engaging than ever. God's will here on earth was actually told to Moses to be passed on to the people. You know, even Jesus didn't pen anything. Yet, he did always refer to this. So Tim brought up a very traditional theology in, in our churchanity, the blood-caused forgiveness. I want us to think about that a little bit. I want to stretch us a little bit. It's a bit of an upside-down thought, so hang on to your hats. Please take a seat. Let me toss this out. Because God wants us to understand the pain in covenant-breaking pain. Breaking covenant for us and how we wronged someone else, or him. God feels the pain, and he wants us to have a greater appreciation for it, and to teach us. Because killing does not and never did forgive sin. God's been the one to forgive, and he told us to do the same, but he forgave before and after the temple sacrifices. It's in the stories. We don't sacrifice for our forgiveness, but we need to appreciate the pain, and there's a cost for our sin. Death and death to the innocent. We are reminded that the sacrifice of that death and the forgiveness is still a heart choice. Because no amount of sacrifice will override the heart. Hence Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Right? Love. Heart. It's at the core. Front and center. Ours should be the same, especially towards others. I know it's a very different way to look at it, but then again, we've used this before, right? I don't want to go, I don't want to go too far down this rabbi hole, right? Um, but I'm going to throw it out there for you to talk amongst yourselves about. Remember that the blood of the Lamb in the Passover had nothing to do with forgiveness at all. It did cause death to be passed over. Hence, blood loss has multiple meanings. It is challenging to understand how and why they are related. So we'll leave it at that. I'll let you talk amongst yourselves. We're going to move on. So you know how we love our holidays, right? We love our remembrances. 
Sometimes the holidays are for remembering something, and sometimes, at least today, it's a topic of choice. There's always the birthday. But independence, military sacrifice, honor of honest labor, right? In America, we have our 4th of July. We have a Memorial Day and Labor Day. But different countries, different days. I like remembrances. And I think one of the biggest reasons that I find these days that God set aside even more interesting. So we have these, and God says, these are mine. These are my days, and why? So again, I'm not compelled that the death and resurrection of the Messiah would be reason to not continue remembering. You know, if it were not for these events, these feast days, these Moedim, right, these festivals, I think we would lose sight of our connection with our past. Because these stories, they capture the very reason that we have the faith to believe in our past. These Moedim actually put us there. How we choose to express each of these, the rituals, the traditions, how we express them, that can change as time progresses. But the when and the why, I don't think they change. But I know it could definitely look different today than it did, say, a thousand years ago. You know, many have pointed out that the Messiah is reflected in these Moedim, right? But that's only seen in hindsight. Um, remembering them, seeing them now in our latest light, it just gives nothing but a, a whole new layer of depth to these days. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a fun study. I suggest maybe you look into these Moedim sometime. Talk amongst yourselves. Tim mentioned that this is how God redeemed them. I agree, it's them. But this is a model and a remembrance. And this is for us to remember. Because God not only did this for them and us, but these are continual words, right? They have past, they have present and future. Because they want us to keep us remembering because I think if we choose not to recognize these Moedim, we're going to miss this tremendous opportunity. These are significant events. And it's because of them that we have our hope and our faith and why the people believed in the Messiah. Because if not, this is just another collection of stories. I mean, it's interesting because some people, they look at them and they don't believe it. And it's just another story to them. It's just another story. They say, hey that's nice. That's a good story. But we, as believers in this God of ours, this yod heh vav -Hey, we follow him because it leads to the love expressed through his Son, our Messiah. I mean, this collection of scrolls, of which this is only number three, yeah, it leads us to Jesus for sure. And yet, beyond. Spoiler alert, the end of the book, that's well beyond his last visit, and we're 2,000 plus years past that in waiting. Only our past, right? Our past has not changed, and nor it's been negated for a theological state, because it's our hope for the future. This is God's will given here in this scroll. It's our hope. Because this actually leads to Messiah. I mean, if I, don't, if I don't get how I'm supposed to love God and our fellow man and how God wants to see it, then I think I'm going to be perplexed when it gets to the time when the Messiah, on the other tied-together red string event, because I think it's going to help us to see that in an entirely different light. Priests, that service role, it's evident in Scripture that it's a service role. Read the description. We're loving God on a vertical level. How does God want us to honor Him? Have 
safe reverence for him. How do we do that on a horizontal level with our fellow man? What's that look like? The framework for all of that is encompassed in that year at the foot of the mountain. Remember, from Leviticus, I mean, from Exodus through Leviticus and into Numbers. You know, to use an American reference, this is where God pens and passes on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for them all rolled into one. So if we want to be priests or God's representatives, then I think it would be wise of us to take a minute, look back, and see what God expects of these representatives. Because it would seem awkward to me that God would say, well, I wanted to look like that back then, but I don't really care about how I'm really represented now. Because we are representing the same God. You know, we like to say God doesn't change. And yet we dismiss that it, what it was to be a representative of God as, as we read these scrolls. We want to be intermediaries, service people, between the people and God. I mean, Moses? Moses is a wonderful example of an intermediary. And we see how, I think what looks like in little steps as these priestly functions are broken out further and further down. Remember, not everyone was the high priest, right? Or had any major function. You know, there's a story about Korah that is going to give us a very stark reminder of that. But cleaning, caring, sharing. That sounds a lot like another Mount message. This scroll of Leviticus it brings up many challenges for us, especially in our churchanity way of life, because we've been told in the past there's not much weight in this anymore. And yet, it is so much so. And we need desperately to look into this, open ourselves up, ask how this impacts our lives today. Because, you know, I fully agree. We are post-temple. Much of the 613 won't apply. But then again, no one was ever supposed to keep entirely the 613, much less... Do it perfectly. But you know, Tim mentioned the uh, sons of Aaron. And he used the term that it's the paradox of living in God's presence. It interests me because we read this. And then we see the action and the reaction and the consequence. But do we really talk about the long-term consequence? I'm not sure we talk about the long-term effect. I think it's because we dismiss a lot of this, and we don't even bother to reflect on Aaron's status after their deaths. I mean, we missed an opportunity to see how, how we might have handled it. Because we saw hearts in action, behavior and example that God expects, and our challenges when we read it, right? Because there's a stark remembrance in this story that God's will, well, on that day, his will, it was supposed to be a day of much rejoicing. But actions, they were counter. Well, it's not really the most pleasant read. You know, sometimes, to be fair, that can be hard in English because they change words around. So sometimes that Repetition of Hebrews underneath. Because remember, we've talked about saying the same word repeatedly again and again, or using the same exact phrase repeatedly. That is exquisite Hebrew. It's just bad English. We miss the chiasm, the emphasis, the context. Leviticus can be a challenge. Not for the meek. It's not a simple read. But I like the point that like being impure is not a sin. Maybe how you got into the state will need to be dealt with on its own. But the state of impure, it's not a sin. It's 
something that God reminds them and us, and we need to address it. And it does affect how we approach God and maybe how we approach our community. It's not a simple topic or a simple discussion, but I do want you to talk amongst yourselves. See how it plays out. Because some of it is within our control. Some of it's not within our control. I'm going to repeat that. Some of it is within our control. Some of it is not. Like, okay, touching a dead body within your control, but having a skin condition, having your menstrual cycle, these happen. Yet, they are still of concern to the community and to God. As I said, it's not a simple conversation, but it is worthwhile. Have it. Don't avoid it. It may be an insight in, in, into the heart. So maybe that's why God instructed them, right, to expose their hearts and our hearts in the first place. I mean, being fair, being clean, eating safe, settling disputes, caring for your neighbor. They're all encapsulated here, right? God is at the center of all of it. His will is at the core of all of it, here on earth, in the land, and for us now and beyond, right? Again, I like how Tim put it, these cultural symbols, they remind Israel that God's holiness affects every part of their lives. That care for the needy, sexual integrity, Social justice. These are all found in that famous 613. Remember, this is just an in introduction, right? This is the very beginning. Because nothing like this has ever existed before. School is officially in session. So I like how Tim wraps this up by saying that we start with the next scroll in this passage where the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. Moses is inside seems there's more to unfold. This is our God teaching from infancy how things play out. So we've gone from outside to inside. There's so much in that for another day. I love this tr transition, and we're going to enjoy it as we step into the book of Numbers. So we finished the third scroll, the third in the Torah, the third in the Tanakh. I think this journey is going to cause us to think. Stretch our thinking. How does that fit with us? How do I need to incorporate this into my everyday life? We're in 2024. Yeah. Let's get ready for numbers. So, thank you for being with us tonight on another thought-provoking episode of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>